you're out, I did promise you something special. I'm not sure how special this will actually be, but it is a video lesson. And we're looking at the next topic. We've looked at the French Revolution. We've seen the excitement of what can happen with enlightenment ideas like individuals are important and the concept of uh, choosing your own rulers rather than being ruled over by a monarch you have no decision in. And we talked about how that could change with things like democracy and the problems of revolution. We talked about how you could execute people by guillotine uh, because it was considered that they were too dangerous to live because they were opponents and how that got kind of out of hand. Uh, well, I'd argue any kind of execution is out of hand from the get-go. So we've talked about why people in Britain were scared of this revolution. We had a situation in Britain where the groups of people in charge made up a very small proportion of the population. We had a situation where not everybody had the vote, a situation where the rich families controlled everything, and a situation where people looked across the channel at what was happening in France and realised that people in Britain were also poor. People in Britain were also without food. And we said maybe it wouldn't be a good idea to fight a war against that revolution, because that would push people in Britain and make them feel that maybe they weren't being represented. And so, I begin our lesson. What I'm going to start with is, well, arguably a bit different. Allow me to demonstrate. Here I have some images. Now, these images are quite old now, but when I made this slide, they were actually quite current, and I used to update it quite regularly. I haven't updated it since 2014. And what I want to know is, what's happening in each of these images? What do they represent? If you're playing along, you'll pause the video and have a think. Okay, that's time to pause the video. You've probably got some ideas about what each image represents. I'm going to go in reverse chronological order. I'll start with the one that's closest to today and then work my way backwards. The first one is from a revolution in Ukraine in 2014. In this particular revolution, the leader of the country was corrupt, was taking money. A group of protesters turned up in the square. This is the square you see on fire here. And he ordered his security services to shoot them dead. So some security services did. The protesters armed themselves with um, riot shields and pieces of metal, no guns, and approached the presidential palace, being shot at all the way. They then took control of the presidential palace, the president fled the country, and they took control of the country. Um, it, was, um, it was pretty brutal for a while. The police drove armoured cars into the protesters, who protected themselves with Molotov cocktails and barricades like the one you see in the image. It was a big deal. Uh, but that Ukrainian revolution is now in control of Ukraine, and as yet there's been no executions by guillotine. The next image is a revolution in Tunisia from 2011. What began, what we now know as the Arab Spring. You ask your parents. It was a big deal back in 2011, which I realise was a good decade ago. But a lot of what's happening in the Middle East now, the Syrian civil war, the Yemen civil war, uh, Saudi Arabia bombing civilians, all of that began with Tunisia. So... It was great for Tunisia. Tunisia is relatively peaceful now and, and relatively happy. Relatively, it's better than it was. It's not perfect. Egypt had a revolution that was largely successful. Um, Syria had a revolution that turned into a bloody civil war and ended up not being successful. Libya overthrew a bloody dictator uh, by the name of uh, Colonel Gaddafi. So it brought good and it brought bad. A bit like, I suppose, the one we looked at last week. On the bottom image, you're beginning to get an idea that the one on the right, as, sorry, uh, on the left as you look at it, is in black and white. So instantly you know it's from the past, but how far in the past? Not all the past, of course, is in black and white. This is a photograph from the Russian Revolution. The trick is in the, uh, uh, the, the alphabet, if any of you spotted that. Well done, you. You know Cyrillic. Uh, if you don't, it's Cyrillic. It's a different alphabet they use in Russia. Uh, this is the Russian Revolution in 1917. A group of working class people rose up and took control. Uh, when I say a group of working class people, it was taken in the name of the working class. The people who took power were called the Bolsheviks. Um, and the new working classes organised a new government, uh, which ended up running uh, as the Soviet Union. And they are, to all intents and purposes, communist, but not in the proper sense. I'm a political science teacher. I, I, I worry about these things. The point is, they took control and they ran the country for the next, well, almost a century, the next 80 years. And they pretty much 
changed the way the world worked as a consequence. And we'll do the Russian Revolution later on in your uh, history education, if you stick with us that long, because it's exciting. Um, this was one of those revolutions that brought good and bad, that brought something called the Red Terror during a civil war. Uh, well, I mean, the name alone says everything you need to know. Red is the colour associated with the working classes. Um, and, yeah, it, it involved a lot of death. And the final one, well, the final one's a famous painting by Delacroix, um, and it's a revolution in France. This painting is called Liberty Leading the People. Uh, Liberty is the woman in the, fr in the foreground waving the tricolour, the revolutionary French flag. Um, we know it as the French flag. Back then it was a revolutionary idea. The idea that the red, the working classes, and the blue, the ruling classes, could have peace between them, the white, and work together to run the country. Well, that was brand new. Um, and we've seen how it could go with the revolution. But bear in mind, the revolution calmed down. As somebody said, Napoleon will take over as emperor and then he'll ransack Europe. Well, yes, he did, kind of. He conquered the whole of Europe. This made Britain angry. Britain fought amongst the Allies fighting against Napoleon. We fought on the side of the kings and the queens. We fought against the idea of liberty and individualism. Exactly what we all agreed would be a really bad idea to do because people in Britain were angry. What are the relevance they have to do with Britain in 1815 to 1833 then? What is the point of me talking about these revolutions? Why mention them? Up until now, we've talked mainly about the story of Britain. We've had a brief sojourn into uh, the United States, as it will come to be known. We've had a look at the American Revolution. We've looked at slavery, which is the British Empire for the most part. We've looked at empire in, in direct. We've looked at the British story. So, so why are we looking now at Ukraine and Tunisia, the Arab Spring, the uh, Russian Revolution, the French Revolution? All of these things don't seem terribly connected to Britain. Have a pause, have a think. What do you think I'm about to talk about? Okay, that's long enough. You've shouted some ideas at the screen or come up with your own. Of course, hang on, this is an execution. This is the end, the terror that swept through France in the French Revolution. This was uh, a working class person showing the crowd the head of an aristocrat who'd been executed for the crime of basically fighting against the state. Later, they would expand that beyond people who were landowners and rich to people that just said the wrong thing, to uh, people that opposed the ideas of the people in charge of the revolution because how else do you deal with things? Uh, the celebrations around the outside, you might notice they're raising up hats um, on, on pikes and spears uh, to show their celebration, but they're surrounded by troops themselves. Um, the revolution got pretty nasty. You can understand why it's scary. It scared people in Britain. How does it link to... <laughs> Don't know if you heard that. Um, it is the sound of an angry mob the sound of an angry crowd. And the question that I'm going to ask you to write as your title uh, might not be terribly visible. I apologise. I've, I've done a Union flag in the background. So um, it's how close was Britain to revolution 1815 to 1833? Obviously write the date in the left-hand margin. That's uh, 10 forward slash 3 forward slash 21. You don't have space to write Wednesday. Don't write Wednesday. It's every Wednesday. Underline both of those. Rule off onto your last piece of work to make it all neat and tidy. And then I'm going to talk you through some things and we've got a couple of tasks to get through. So, Dateline, France, 1789. Let's sum up what we did last week. A vicious revolution there had led to great changes. The people had risen up, taken over the government and killed the royal family. Many rich nobles have been killed by the guillotine. That's how you spell guillotine, because it's French, you see, they don't pronounce all the letters. Rich people all over the world came to see this, the guillotine, as a symbol of blood, death and chaos. By 1815, it was all over, but the danger was not past. Many people in England saw the possibility of revolution around the corner. Some looked forward to settling old scores, some to changing the way things worked, and others feared what might happen to their heads. There we go. Love the sound effects. Um, there were new methods of work. We talked about the Industrial Revolution already. New industrial towns were growing up all over Britain. There was Bradford, there was Leeds, Manchester, Lancaster, uh, Liverpool, um, Stoke-on-Trent, uh, Newcastle, Sunderland, mainly in the north. Derby and Nottingham were growing, but they don't really count as major industrial towns, not yet. Um, so although the Industrial Revolution started just up the road from us in Cromford, uh, no wait, uh, pointing 
than that. Well, it doesn't matter. Pointing towards Cromford from where I'm sat. Um, that's where the Industrial Revolution began, but the big cities grew up elsewhere. Uh, men, women and children were working long hours in poor conditions for low wages. Nothing you don't already know. We've tackled this. Life was awful. They were tired, they were poor, and they were annoyed that the government did not seem to want to help them. Groups of people, like the Luddites and frame breakers pictured, had gone around trying to destroy these new methods of work, to try and regain some control over their own lives, and they had utterly failed. They had been beaten at every turn. Factory owners had employed people with rifles and guns to shoot at them. Pitched battles had been fought in some streets, some, not all. And there had been, well, the attempt to stop the Industrial Revolution in its tracks, or make it more fair, had failed. Nowadays, we refer to people as Luddites when they don't like new technology and they're too stupid to understand it. We use it as an insult. It wasn't meant that way at the beginning. The original Luddites were all about trying to protect wages and keep people safe. Hang on, again. The second major problem was new ideas. One new idea in particular had caused the French Revolution. The idea that everyone could be equal. They could be the same. Now, that doesn't mean the same in outcome. I, I am clearly different to other people. Thank God for everybody else. If everyone looked like me, I'd feel sorry for everyone in the world. But everyone could have the same opportunities. Everyone could have something to look after them. Life could be different. What if you weren't paid for the work that you did, but you were paid for the needs that you had? So a binman with 12 children would get paid more than a brain surgeon who lived alone. Or, alternatively, a binman with no children would get paid the same as a brain surgeon with no children, or less than a brain surgeon with a child. Not for the work you do, but for the needs you have. This was sort of happening at points in the French Revolution, before it was all beaten up by Napoleon, and most people in Britain agreed that Napoleon had done the wrong thing. They were happy to fight Napoleon, but not the revolution. Some writers in Britain dared to suggest that people could have what we call the same rights, the right to vote, the right to have a say in how much is paid in taxes, the right to life, the right to food, the right to an education, the right to clean water. Maybe everybody deserved those rights, not just rich people. Money! Wealth! Here is Isambard Kingdom Brunel. He is the most powerful engineer in British history. A, a figure we've seen ourselves. Remember that thing with the opening of the, uh, the Olympics in 2012 that I showed you and ranted about? This is what Kenneth Branagh was playing. This is the man who took his place in history. He was incredibly wealthy. The new factories in new towns had owners. People who built them. People, well not physically, people who'd come up with the idea or stolen the idea and employed people in their factories. Those production lines made things that they could sell. These men were not of noble birth. They were traders and factory owners, rich and proud. The government seemed to be ignoring them and they were angry. How dare the government take our money? How dare the government make us pay taxes and not ask us our opinion on what those taxes should be spent upon? We are powerful. We give the power to Britain. Our armies will be unable to march and defeat Napoleon were it not for our factories producing weapons and ammunition, clothing and uniforms, food and shelter. And the government have denied us the chance to vote for them. This made people angry. We call these people, yeah, you guessed it, they're called the middle classes. So the working classes are annoyed. And then there's the government itself. The style of government is old. Here are two prime ministers of the day. Uh, Lord Liverpool is one, the other one is a caricature, it's a joke drawing of a prime minister. And you get a feeling that, well, these are not the same sort of people we've been seeing. Britain had had the same system of government now for hundreds of years, since the Civil War. Several of you mentioned that last lesson. The Civil War in the 1600s had pretty much said that Parliament was in charge, but it kind of hadn't. There were lots of things that were still in the hand of a bunch of people who were unelected, called the House of Lords. And these lords often provided the Prime Minister as well. They ran the show, 
and they didn't really want to extend the boat. They were quite happy with the way things were. They had power rather than the king, though the king does, did still have some power. They could vote down any new ideas the government might have, and that stopped change. And they didn't want change. They liked things the way they were. Some people, however, did want change. They wanted reforms to reform the way political ideas worked. We've talked about these before. Some reformers wanted to change child labour, for example, but the Lords were against that. Why should we change the way things are? Some people wanted to reform the way voting worked, maybe give the middle classes some voting rights. But why change? The Lords liked things the way they were. These people who wanted reform were called radicals. Radical simply means large change. So radicals want large change quickly. That's all it means. That's literally the term. That's why it's in bold there. You now know the word radical and the word reform. It's a political change. Radical means they want it quickly. These radicals said that everyone should be allowed to vote, even women. They said it was unfair that just rich people could vote. Alrighty. Below our task, there are two. I've got a revolutionary checklist. We're going to be referring to this quite frequently, actually. And this was thought up by a historian called Christine Council. And she said, you could work out how close a country was to revolution by ticking off these listed points. When you've ticked off all of these things, then a country is close to revolution. You don't need all of them to have a revolution. And equally, if you have all of them, you might not have a revolution. But if you tick them all off, you're really, really close. And the likelihood is there's going to be a revolution. Now, when I first did this back in 2011, when the Arab Spring was happening, we actually assigned this list to real life examples and it proved to be true. We were able to predict which countries were going to have a revolution before they had it by ticking things off on our list. That's how effective this list is. So, what is this list? How can you tell if a country is close to revolution? It's in the little uh, purple box. The following checklist will help. The more things you can check off, the more likely a revolution is. So, first thing, working classes are poor and have no power. The government ignores them, they don't get paid very much, and yeah, that's it. The second one, the middle classes are rich and have no power. They've got loads of money, loads of trade, loads of wealth, but the government ignores them. The rulers and upper classes are rich and refuse to share power, so they don't want change. The government makes some changes and then stops making those changes. So they say we can do it, but they decide not to. The poor are more hungry than usual. Maybe there's been a famine. Maybe there's been a failure in harvest. Maybe the price of food has gone up. And the army decides not to obey the orders from the rulers. That is when you get close to revolution. Okay, the task is as follows. Task A, you'll notice I haven't numbered it, so just write A in the margin. How does each problem point to the revolution, the possibility of revolution towards Britain? In other words, explain how each of these boxes means that people are angry enough to try and be violent towards their government, to change the way the government works. Why would new methods of work make people angry? Why would new ideas mean that people want to get rid of their government? Why would new wealth mean that the middle classes are upset with the government? And why does old government make a lot of people upset with the way government works? That's your first task. So you should have four reasonably long sentences, maybe two or three, that follow a rough peel structure. The point, there are new methods of work. The explanation, this made people angry because. The example, things like low wages and men, women and children working all hours God sends, but still not having enough to live off. And then linking it back, this meant that a revolution was likely because. You see how it works? Peel. It doesn't have to be long, but you need at least four sentences, as I say, maybe two or three per point, depending on how much you want to write and explain your point. The point here is explanation, not just stating things. The second point, B, which problem seems most important to you? Explain your answer. Now, for A, you might notice that I went through that revolutionary checklist and I haven't mentioned it again. Maybe the explanations as to why a particular point may lead to revolution can be found in the checklist. Maybe you can match a problem to a point on the checklist, say what the problem is and why it leads to the thing on the checklist, and therefore that makes a revolution more likely. In other words, which parts of the checklist can we tick off 
right at the beginning and have running for the rest of our bit on this. And B is an opinion question. To win this one, you pick one of those four reasons that you think is important. You compare it to another one of those reasons and say why it is more important than that reason. You only have to do it to one other and say why you think it's more important. If you're playing along, you'll pause this video to do that now. OK, I will check your work when you come back into school. Don't worry, we'll discuss it. But I do have another thing. Now, this one, there's less input from me. So I'm just going to set you up and you're going to work through yourselves on this one. You'll see what I mean. It's relatively simple. There's no animations of um, sound this time. We're going to skip forward two more years. We're missing an event called the Sparfields Riot. Now, the Sparfields Riot essentially took all of those points that we had on the revolutionary checklist and ticked them off. Spoiler alert, you can tick off the working classes being poor and having no power, the middle classes being rich and having no power, the rulers and upper classes being rich and refusing to share power. Those three points were all ticked off. The crowd at Sparfields in 1816 brought with them the French tricolour and started shouting at soldiers. Then there was a riot where they attacked some of the soldiers and the soldiers fought back. In the end, no one died, but it was dangerous. Hundreds of thousands of people had turned up. Now, Sparfields was on the outskirts of what was then London. Nowadays, it's in the centre of London, but back then it was still on the outskirts. So this was worrisome. People in the capital were worried that people were that upset, but maybe it was localised. We're going to look at something called... Um... Oh, hang on. Um, oh, yes. So what happens next? The government worried about the Sparfields riot, decided to check how many people out in the countryside were really up for trying to bring down the government. Was revolution close? In 1817, town, uh, taxes were still very high, especially on bread. Oh, the poor might be more hungry than usual if bread is going up in price. And businesses were still closing. Following the end of the Napoleonic War, the government stopped buying a lot of uh, material. And so rich business owners, in order to maintain their richness, simply closed factories. Loads of people, for the very first time, had no work. Unemployment, as we would call it, had come into being. These people got nothing. There were no benefits. There was no support. Nothing. They could not afford to grow food because they lived in towns and cities. And they could not buy food because they got no money. These people would likely die of starvation. Many would. Think on that the next time you decide that unemployed people or useless to society. You could end up with uh, uh, them dying. Maybe you agree with that, but I don't think you do because you're good human beings. The government, this led to riots all across Britain, not just spa fields, but all over the country. The government decided to use spies to try and find out what the radicals would do next, because these people had said they wanted to change, and now they had a bunch of angry men and women and children who might join them and make things happen. One of these spies was codenamed Oliver, and he joined radical groups all over the north of England. He told them that there was a revolution planned, that it was going to happen, and that all the radical groups would be involved. And then he informed the government that the radicals were planning a revolution. So he goes to radicals, says, there's a revolution planned, are you in? And they go, well, if everyone's in, I guess we're in. And then he says, right, I'll take down your names to send them on, and then sends them to the government. This is called entrapment. He's tricked them into saying they want a revolution. In Derbyshire, oh look, it's where we live. Poor unemployed workers, led by a man named Brandreth, proper Derbyshire name, believed Oliver that a revolution was planned and tried to take Nottingham by force. They were told by Oliver that a group of radicals would descend on Nottingham, they'd all join together, they'd take over Nottingham and then march on London like a revolutionary army. They expected to be joined by thousands of others from across northern England. When they got there, no one joined them, and they fled from armed soldiers in the city. There's Derbyshire. There's where they were going. Uh, they walked up to uh, Nottingham Castle, almost as it would have appeared. The castle did look different. They burned it down in, uh, in a later um, riot. The, cas the 
house that now stands on Castle Hill is slightly lower and doesn't look as much castle-like. The houses are the same though, and the hill is the same. So, although the castle looks different, it's the best view I could find for 1817. There is another picture of the castle burning down, but no pictures of the castle as it would have looked before it burned down at the right time. So I can't show you those, I'm afraid. Um, so yeah, they marched to the castle, got this far. No one joined them, they were like, ah. Uh. Instead, they saw a bunch of armed soldiers, some on horseback, and they ran away. Most of them were captured, and they were put on trial for revolution. Brandreth and three other ringleaders, people in charge, were found guilty of treason and plotting a revolution. They were executed in public. The last public beheading in England. It's the only image I could find. That's the actual image of uh, Brandreth's execution. It's the only image I can find of it. There was no revolution. Indeed, had there ever been one planned? Or was Oliver just stirring up trouble to make a name for himself and get paid by the government? Did Brandreth and three others die for no reason? Here are the tasks I'm going to ask you to complete. So if you want to number this as two, I don't know, or 1817, um, you've done the first two. These two, uh, three rather, you're going to do on your own. I'm not going to give you too much input, but I'll, I'll talk you through them. A. Was the Derbyshire Revol Rising a real attempt at revolution, or was Brandreth tricked into it? That's an opinion question. Based on the information, you're a good historian. On the one hand, it was real because blah, 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 blah. On the other hand, it wasn't because blah, 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 blah. Therefore, overall, it was probably, and then you give your answer and a reason why. So give two sides. You should end up with a reasonably long answer, uh, maybe a, a short paragraph on one side, a short paragraph on the other side, and then a, an overall conclusion, we call it. If you wish to use the term in conclusion, feel free. It makes you feel good. Do it. I like the term in conclusion. B. Was the government right to use spies like Oliver in order to prevent a revolution? On the one hand, they were right because blah, 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 blah. On the other hand, it posed problems because blah, 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 blah. I think, and then you give your opinion, but give both sides first, okay? So maybe five, ten minutes on that first one, five, ten minutes on B. And then C. How close was Britain to revolution in 1817? Can you tick off things on the checklist? How many can you tick off? Does that mean we were close? Not that close. Really close? Not close at all. Do you see what I mean? Answer the question having ticked off the thing. So it was close because blah, 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 blah. Or it wasn't terribly close because it only ticked off these ones. And that's a perfectly valid answer. So although it's the hardest one to do because you've got to refer to the other side of the sheet, uh, the, the previous slide, um, it should be your shortest answer of the three. The other two should be slightly longer. Now, hopefully, that means you've got a lot of stuff that you know and are able to write down. This video has taken half an hour. I imagine if you've got this far, you're looking at 45 minutes with 15 minutes remaining to answer those questions at the end of the second slide on the PowerPoint. Or is it the third slide on the PowerPoint? Third slide on the PowerPoint. So um, best of luck to you. As always, if you want to submit your work on to um, show my homework do. I'll get back to you as soon as I can with any kind of feedback. Um, and obviously I'll mark it normally with the smiley face or the mm, or the mm, um, faces. That wasn't much of a change between the last two faces. Never mind. I hope it's been interesting to you. I hope it's whetted your appetite and made you excited about coming into school tomorrow to be tested. And then I shall see you the following week on the Wednesday if I don't see you beforehand. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics as you can probably tell. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing you properly and discussing it and seeing what you've come up with in your own time. Have a lovely rest of your day, Year 8. I'm looking forward to seeing you on uh, next Wednesday and I'm sure you're looking forward to coming back into school. See you around.